A new realism for disability on stage. In image number one, a photo of Greg Mosgala and Kara Young. In image number two, a photo of Katie Sullivan and David Zayas. The portrayal of people with disabilities on stage, screen, or in print used to range from disappointing to gag-inducing. By turns monstrous, vengeful, pitiable, or supernatural, the characters were shown as completely swallowed up by their disability. Take Anne and Tilly, a novel from 1869. Quote, Picture a saint's face that has grown holy with waiting and suffering, with the meekest eyes and the sweetest smile that were ever seen in this poor wicked world, set on a poor, deformed, crooked body, forever wasting with pain and anguish, forever being tortured with some unknown incurable disease, and you have Tilly Marguerite before you. Stories frequently ended in death, as in The Little Hunchback from 1845. Quote, Poor Ellen was hardly seven years old, and yet did she long to die. Say it is not wrong for me to feel so, dear mother, she would sometimes say. Earth is not for me. No one can love me here but you. These aren't fleshed-out characters. They're signifiers, literary devices, irrelevant to actual people with disabilities. Audiences and readers might be provoked to sympathy, curiosity, or dread by such figures, but there was little scope for identification with them. These tropes are still alive in our culture. Think of Tiny Tim, Zombies, Bran Stark, even Freddy Krueger. To be sure, they don't have the disability stage all to themselves anymore. Films like Coda, Crip Camp, Ray, even the old TV show Ironside present better rounded portraits than their predecessors did. But actually hiring actors with disabilities remains a rarity, and so does depiction of characters for whom disability is just routine, more involved perhaps, but not fundamentally different from people who need glasses. Recently, however, a Broadway production has seriously pushed against those limits. Cost of Living, the Pulitzer Prize-winning play by Martina Majok, weaves parallel stories around two disabled characters. John is a grad student with cerebral palsy, and Annie is a long-divorced woman with double-leg amputations and a spinal cord injury from a not-quite-recent crash. On one level, Cost of Living is a story about consumer-directed home care, the other two characters are either hired or volunteer for the job, a plot device that has to be unprecedented, or nearly so. The play's starting point is home care's unique exchange of intimate care and day-in, day-out conversation, formalized through at-will contracts and an hourly wage. But Cost of Living is no documentary or even a movie of the week. It's a story about the characters' relationships, which are complicated. Annie's new employee, Eddie, is her ex-husband, who is both still besotted with her and in need of a paycheck. Jess, John the grad student's new hire, is a recent Ivy League grad who seems to spend every minute working one job or another. The grad student is wealthy and snarky. The ex-wife is a tough-as-nails Bayonne native, highly skilled with four-letter words. The play flits back and forth between these pairs of consumers and attendants with rotating sets to match. The two disabled employers are gnarly personalities and anything but passive recipients of care. They supervise and define their attendance duties with uninhibited projection. I found that very satisfying. Still, cost of living does not entirely escape traditional tropes. The play reveals more of the non-disabled characters' backstories than the disabled characters, and while Katie Sullivan's performance as Annie blasts with emotional intensity, practically her every moment on stage revolves around disability. Annie's injuries are severe, fatal, as we learn in the opening. Her story is told in flashback by the ex-husband, portrayed sympathetically by David Zayas. Annie had a full human life before the accident, but not, the play suggests, afterwards. And then she dies, leaving Annie bereft and out of a job. There are a lot of strengths to the Annie Eddy story, but for me, it smacked just a little of Tilly and Ellen. Meanwhile, the team of John the grad student and Jess the college grad employee flourishes, maybe a little too well, since Jess develops romantic feelings for her employer. This sets her up for a hit when John runs roughshod over those feelings. 
It's not clear whether he does so by accident or by intention, but whatever his motives may be, they seem to have nothing to do with disability. And this is my favorite moment in the play because it puts the character beyond the usual noble, evil, pathetic stereotypes. John is just another stupid, self-centered man living his life. Hooray! John's rejection of Jess, if that's what it is, leads to a reaction scene that highlights Kara Young's versatile navigation of the play's most complex character. The final payoff comes at the curtain call when we learn that the disabled characters are actually played by disabled actors. Katie Sullivan, who originated the role of Annie, is a former Paralympian, and Greg Mosgala, who won the Lucille Lortel Award for Best Actor, describes himself as a triple threat, actor, writer, cripple. Their entrances as themselves absolutely brought the mostly non-disabled house down. Cost of living fits into a growing canon of perceptive rather than reductive takes on disability. As a marker of the distance that the disability rights movement has pushed our culture over the past 60 years, its Pulitzer Prize pedigree to arrival on Broadway is nothing less than a triumph. Cost of Living at the Samuel J. Friedman Theater, 261 West 47th Street, New York, New York, 10036. Wheelchair accommodations, ramp, elevator slash access lift, seating platforms, removable seats, ADA bathrooms. Visual accommodation, eye captions, hearing accommodations, T-coil loop, ALD audio descriptive, open caption matinees with TDF. Note. A version of this entry appeared in Able News.